Well, we well, Jane to... had one, so I didn't want her to think she was drinking alone. This meeting's now streaming live on Facebook, so this oh, is no longer okay. the open yes, COVID fine. yet. <laughs> oh, now I... streaming. And hey, great. Emily, I haven't seen you in ages. It's great to see you. Hey, Emily. Okay, so I think we got a kind of a small group tonight. We're we're missing a few folks. I'm just going to uh, mention them out loud here real quick in case so they join in. Um, Susan Zarenda signed up. Brooke is signed up, and there's uh, our lovely Miss Brooke, right? He's so, gone to the dogs. <laughs> gone to the dog. <laughs> Technical question: We don't know who's on Facebook watching us, right? Unless they sign, unless they comment. Oh, uh, uh, we do. Well, I know because I can see, but you don't know. Oh, <laughs> we're going to share. You can see, Jonathan. You can see on Facebook who who all is. I can, yes. Uh -huh. okay, and cool. if they if they comment or like, you're able to see it here when you go have a look. But yes, at any given moment, only only the administrator can see who's watching. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so that's the power of administration. So there had to be one power. I guess that's it. <laughs> it's a magic. Go ahead. It's someone with cool shoes. Yeah. yeah. That's right. <laughs> yes. Robin Prince Monroe may join us, Ann Chadwell Humphreys, and Susan oh. Jean McCartney. All those folks also signed up. So, um, so, uh, so we may be admitting some folks as we go on. So welcome to the January open mic of the Pat Conroy Literary Center in association with the South Carolina Writers Association. My name is Vivian Bickledge and uh, I am your uh, ever present MC for this <laughs> evening. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And so glad to see everybody's faces and happy new year and happy new year to everybody out there in Facebook Thanks. land. So. Um, tonight, our featured reader is going to be Estelle Ford Williams, so she'll be pulling up the rear of the open mic, and we'll look forward to that. I have a couple announcements I'd like to just put out there real quick. Uh, Niles Reddick uh, couldn't join us this evening. He's not feeling so great. He asked uh, me to remind the group of a couple of quick things. One is um, he's judging the Vancouver Flash Fiction Prompt. And he said, you can find that on the Facebook page and he hopes he'll get some entries to the Vancouver flash fiction prompts open to everyone. Um, he's also, and I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Let me, I got two computers going here at once. We got a lot of great workshops coming up at the Pat Conroy Literary Center. And I want to do a shout out there real quick. Give me one moment because I had it all ready to go. And it is right here. Niles is one of them. Niles will be doing a, a workshop on January 21st entitled Cultivating Flash. Um, so any of you that are interested in flash fiction, I know I am. Um, and it's a cool thing for poets as well to try flash fiction because you know we write these, you know, compressed pieces, whatever, whatever this means. I don't think you write like that, but so, yeah. <laughs> You're very... anyway, January 21st, um, Niles Reddick. So get on the Pat Conroy, right, Jonathan, help me there. So they can get on the uh, Pat Conroy Center website and see these events, right? Yes, they can go to our Facebook page, which is a nice, easy way to register for these things. Or you can go to patconroyliterarycenter.eventbrite.com, which is ah. uh, a straight shortcut into our registration page. Thank you. Thanks for the help, because I've gone in different ways, and I'm not a Facebooker, so <coughs> yeah, so help that helps us. Brooke McKinney is doing a, a workshop on January 28th called Desire in Storytelling. How characters tell us what they want. Um, on February 3rd, we have Susan Madison doing Meditation as Muse, which is penning poetry from the soul. February 10th, we have an audiobook production for the uninitiated. Um, that's being put on by Joe Formicella and Suzanne Hudson. That sounds like a pretty unique opportunity. So take a look at that for more detail. <laughs> and then we have a few of our uh, 
regulars coming up in April. Uh, April 7th um, is Miho Kina uh, with hands on linked haiku. So that should be uh, pretty, pretty interesting. And of course, Miho is just fantastic in, in that particular uh, art of poetry. Haiku is, I think, how can you say something really right in the, one of the most short forms? So, or have cats jump on you, right? <laughs> And then, Vivian, Vivian you have the same hand gesture for haiku that you have for flash I fiction. I know. I don't know what this means. <laughs> Everybody I'm knows. Get my dancing sea turtle. He'll help me out here. Today. <laughs> All right. So, and then Elizabeth Robin. This is a really. I've taken one of Elizabeth's workshops on 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 grief writing. That was the first time we ever met. But hers her uh, workshop will be in April. April 14th, when COVID is all gone and writing as healing will be a wonderful topic. So April 14th. And I think those are the workshops right now that are in the lineup. I'd also encourage people to, um, there's two things going on with the South Carolina Writers Association. One is the upcoming virtual writers conference that'll be April 16th through the 18th. And tomorrow is the last early bird registration to get a discount. So um, you've got a lot of great, Marley Russoff is gonna be there. You've got a couple agents, poets, uh, uh, Patty Henry Callahan will be one of the keynotes. But there's also a really cool thing going on with South Carolina writers that's in there events calendar on myscwa.org and because they were funded by the South Carolina Humanities these are free and open and there's writing conversations become an author topics and I would encourage you guys to get on there and just scroll through the list these are all the way <clears throat> here but there's a lot of great information there so sorry to bog down the readings with a lot of uh information or announcements, but um, really a lot of great opportunities for us. Yes, Miss Jane. And, and also, don't forget our lovely Miss Estelle is being interviewed by Brooke McKinney. That, Estelle, what night is that? And, and Bren McLean. It's the 20th, um, inauguration night. Yep. Yeah, well, let my me- My book came I, out I, on January 5th and my big interview with the Pat Conroy Center hour long you know, talk highlight mm -hmm is on January 20th. Wonderful, I can't so, wait. People won't be at the inaugural balls though, so maybe I'm in luck. <laughs> maybe I'm in luck. Oh dear. Yeah, yeah so I had um, Estelle's, um, it's not, uh, for some reason I can't share, Jonathan. I have um, Estelle's, uh, wait a minute, multiple persist, let me try this. I have a, uh, let me show that if I can. Do you guys see my screen by chance? No. 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 Ugh. Yeah, so it's, it's an evening with Estelle Ford Williamson, January 20th at 6 p.m. Between the pack, sponsored by Pat Conroy Center and Nevermore Books. Uh, so also we always wanna try to support our independent booksellers, so. Right. They, they got copies and um, they're, they're selling. And so we're glad to have them participate and they've been really wonderful. Okay, I'm so sorry. Also that evening we'll have some music. Uh, it's, it's an hour long interview and there'll be music from um, a couple in Rising Fawn. Oh, very and, cool. Um, very they cool. are the inspiration for one of the scenes in my book. I was thinking of them when I put it together and also thinking of my sister who used to have a lot of jam sessions in farmhouses all over the Chattanooga area or, or Knoxville area or Athens area. Oh, so. thank you. Oh, great. There it is. There it is. There's the announcement. Super. Wow. So we're going to need some, uh, uh, so, you know, we got the inauguration ball going on or not. I don't know what's going <laughs> I don't know what they're going to do. <laughs> So I, I just hope they stay safe, whatever they're doing. Or I hope they do it on Zoom. I think a Zoom inauguration would be great. Well, that would be cool. 
I, I wish that would I be could. cool. So I'm up against some pretty heavy hitters, guys. So yeah. tune yeah. in for us at least a short time so I can say, hey, she was here, he was here. I had my audience. <laughs> thank right. you. I, I just want to say thank you to Jonathan and the whole center for making this possible. It's okay. a dream come true. So thank you. You're welcome, Estelle. We're, we're honored to get to do this with you. Thank you. All right. All right. Welcome, uh, Brooke McKinney as well. We're glad you're here. And we're going to start off then with uh, John Williams tonight. John, <laughs> I'm putting you right up front in the new year. All right. Remember, we got a three minute limit, but we got a small group tonight. So we're going to be, uh, but we're starting at 615. So, um, but we're going to be, I think we got plenty of time uh, for the wonderful writing and writers that we're about to hear. So take it away, John. Thank you, Vivian. Um, this is from my novel, Pocatatago Point. If, if you, any of you heard last time, um, the young seven or eight year old protagonist, Donnie, has just sent his uncle Jeff, seen him off in the, with the family on the bus to Korea, to Korea during the, the Korean War. And this is um, Donnie talking about his uncle Jeff in Korea. When, when Jeff got to Japan, they took away a lot of the stuff he didn't need and gave him a rifle, pack, canteen, ammo pouches, and all the other junk you need to fight a war. I knew something about most of it. Some of Uncle Jeff's old military stuff hangs on a spike in the barn, and I sometimes borrow his pack for camping trips. I put cheese crackers in the ammo pouches. Jeff says each pouch holds eight rounds. Jeff had landed at Busan just like that he thought, and then they sent him up to the front lines. He said they were dug in along the Nakon River near the village of Taku, which was where the army kept most of his supplies. He was eating a K ration when he wrote, and he said he was sorry about the chocolate stain, but he had to eat fast. An artillery battalion was moving through some valley where the North Koreans might be hiding, and they needed infantry protection. Daddy and I got out the world book and the map he'd drawn. He's right there, Daddy said. He tapped the map with his finger, right there. Daddy drew the city and the river on his map and sketched in some mountains. Looking down, I felt like I was there, sitting beside Uncle Jeff on a riverbank, looking out for bad guys the way my daddy, the way my friend Davey and I do when we play war along the Coosiehatchee. You think he's scared, I asked Daddy. A little, he answered. It's good to be a little scared, keeps you alert. Mostly he's tired, tired, dirty, and missing grandmama's cooking. You think he misses Sue Ellen? Yeah, I stopped in at Bubba's for breakfast one morning when she was working. Jeff writes her about every day. She says there might be a surprise when Jeff gets back. What kind of surprise? If I knew it wouldn't be a surprise, he gave me this sort of crankly smile and I knew he knew, he just wasn't telling. It was, how am I doing on time? I have no idea. Good. Fine, John, go ahead. You're fine. It was Saturday, so I called my friend Davey to see if he wanted to play Army tomorrow. Davey had to work most Saturdays, but his dad's stores closed on Sunday. All the stores in downtown Yemisee close on Sunday. They say it's a religious thing because the Bible says you must rest on the Sabbath. But when this Jewish guy tried to close on Saturday and open on Sunday, they wouldn't let him, even though daddy says the Jewish Sabbath is on Saturday. Religion's a funny thing. Lots of people argue about it. Mama and grandmama and granddaddy take it pretty seriously, but daddy doesn't seem to care much. Neither does Uncle Jeff. I heard daddy, Uncle Jeff, and granddaddy talking one day just after Jeff had joined up and we were feeding the cows before church. Are you right with the Lord, granddaddy asked Jeff? I hear tell there's no atheist in foxholes and you don't go to church much. Jeff was breaking up my hay bale and he didn't answer right away. Granddaddy looked at my dad. How about you, Walt? Think that's true? Daddy studied granddaddy for what seemed like a long time, but really only a second. I don't know about Jeff, Mr. Shepherd. Daddy sometimes called granddaddy Julius, but when he's serious, he calls him Mr. Shepherd. But that's where I became one. Nobody said anything for a minute. Granddaddy looked real hard at daddy and I could tell he wanted to say something else, but he didn't. Daddy picked up a strand of hay and held it in his teeth like a cigarette. Come on, he says, we can't keep the ladies waiting. 
I don't know what an atheist, I didn't know what an atheist was, but I could tell granddaddy didn't like them. I started to ask, but considering the look he gave daddy, I decided to wait until we were done. We walked into the house and daddy, with me and daddy leading, this when we got to the porch, I heard granddaddy tell Jeff, we'll keep praying for you. Thanks dad, Uncle Jeff said. It should, sure didn't hurt last time. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Thank wonderful. you, John. Yeah, yeah. It's a, you do a beautiful job writing in um, this young this young boy's voice. Yeah, thank you. Really, really great. And I, I think we all love the association with the Low Country. You're kind of taking us into a world. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay, um, Elizabeth Robin, would you like to, I don't know if you're gonna do some poetry this week. Every time I say, are you doing poetry, then people <laughs> trick me and they do fiction or something, so. Well, um, what I'm gonna read tonight is from another piece from um, uh, a nonfiction, but I, I kind of have an announcement because I got an email like five minutes before I signed on. Okay. It seems I'm going to have a third poetry book. Oh, <laughs> so, oh congratulations! So jumping out of my skin <laughs> at the moment. Wow! What's uh, the title? What's the? It's a collection. What's the title? It's a, it's a full length this time, and it's called "To My Dream Catcher," and it's it accrued seven rejections. <laughs> and uh after the first six rejections last year i had someone look at it and i revamped it based on his critique and submitted it again different title and everything fantastic and, uh, fancy and, uh, and, and yeah, exactly. you heard it here yeah, first picked it up yeah yeah first <laughs> who's the who's so, the publisher robin um, um well i'm not sure yet i've got two still out so i'm going to wait and and See, I've got a month to decide whether to take this offer or not. Oh, so, really? Wow. <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah. yeah, I'm kind of like my head's exploding. But uh, anyway, uh, and it's kind of funny because the, the part I was going to read you tonight, um, I actually end this chapter with the poem that's the first poem in this collection. But you've heard the poem. I'm not reading that far. Um, this is uh, from that. 18, uh, 19,000 plus mile trip I took with my dog Byron. And um, several times when I've read sections from this, people have said, you know, I never hear about people you met. Um, so this chapter is about my um, time at in Medora, North Dakota, which is a really interesting little town just outside of the south section of the Teddy Roosevelt National Park which I was visiting. It's a weird park. It's like in two separate zones that are about an hour apart. Um, and uh, I landed there July 4th of uh, that year. This was 2018. So I'm just gonna read you a little part that's about somebody I met there. By now, I explore and manage life in campgrounds easily. At the Cottonwood Campground, we have a huge campsite, lots of room for Byron to roam. We can't even see the campers next door. Its eponymic trees create an odd snowy feel. I jot down this note. Cottonwood snow drifts across the camp, dances along or sticks. The river woodlands wind constant calls a do, -si -do. I journal about the Medora campsite, a real contrast. We are sardines without oil, packed into an untended lawn. There are trees and gnats to push the discomfort, a passable bathroom, but a well-stocked store. With WD-40 and duct tape, I conquer the world. <laughs> By now, I've learned to use about a liter of water for morning coffee and cleanup, both me and dishes. I meet Annette, a very young widow. Her husband died at 51 of kidney cancer, diagnosed at 45. This the information widows trade, how long of what, why here. She's also in a Ford Escape, but with a cuter teardrop, wood kitchen cabinets, and inside a bench seat and table. It sports a full screen door. I am jealous. 
She travels on a one year $80 national park pass. And when we talk about people who ask why we travel alone, she blurts, what am I supposed to do? Spend the rest of my life locked in my house? We bond right then. I think about aloneness, how our culture discourages it, the difference between this and loneliness. Until now, I have never lived alone. I moved from my father's house to a college dorm, to a first marriage and children, to a second marriage, more children. I lived a full, amazing life packed with people pulling at me. But all those people have fallen away from my life. Now I fight a war to stay connected, force myself to create social time every day. Irony, no longer a plot device, it's my life story. Every day is a whole, every year a minefield of death adversaries where I fight to treasure warm memories and not notice the huge holes in my days. At first I could only do it through outings with Byron. He attracts people when I cannot. Although he's even shyer than I am, he withstands the attention as though he knows he's my lifeline to the world. Annette and I talk about this, how we are learning on our travels to be alone, but not lonely. It's survival. On July 4th, I sip my morning coffee in the quiet, watching the clouds. I do this often. Someone toward the back of the park throws those loud bang snap things for over an hour. How festive. Byron's not happy nor, I imagine, has this pleased anyone who might still be sleeping. I assure Byron it's not anything but some idiot who has no sense that others want the morning stillness or have dogs afraid of loud noises. I spot a bird, watch it fly. I know Annette relates to what I wrote later and then it ends with the poem in clouds. That, that, um... Your your non your memoir nonfiction is poetic. It, I mean, it, you just from the sardines to the <laughs> WD four. It was really um, you had us there. That was uh, really great. How I learned but, to do repairs. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> well, I love the jealousy of the teardrop. Or yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice work, and and we're so happy for you. Good luck with choosing your you know your publisher and yeah yeah i'm i'm very excited and and hopefully um because of the way this works it'll be well after all the covid you know and i can actually launch a book <laughs> excellent good for you elizabeth you deserve it thank you it's beautiful i really enjoyed that all right next I want to stop north dakota it is but we can talk later Next up, we have Catherine Tandy Brown. Ms. Catherine, if you, uh, I have no idea what you're reading from or what genre, so maybe you can help us out a little bit. I think I just made up a genre with this one. <laughs> okay. But it's from a short story entitled SWAT, S-W-A-T. And <laughs> it's a little unusual, let me just say that. I'm not a fan of horror but it seemed to have come through a little bit. And, and this is just from the middle of the story. Um, I was walking actually in your neighborhood, um, your old neighborhood, Vivian, a couple of years ago, or maybe a year or so ago. And yeah. I noticed that we'd had lots of rain and there were mosquitoes absolutely everywhere. And so I thought about, I thought about what would happen if they really just kept on growing and growing? So that's the only background you need for this. Okay, they have done this in this particular era. It's a little bit in the future, but not very much. Okay, the shattering of glass in her living room picture window jarred her back to the present. She knew what had caused it and that she should run out the back door to the garage, hop in her armored vehicle and drive like hell. That's what she'd been warned to do these beasts were the reason armor was required now. But the spectacle in front of her was mesmerizing. A proboscis the size of a fire hose snaked its way around her living room. It seemed to be sniffing, like Timothy's pit bull in a stranger's house. Her grandmother's hand-painted lamp splintered as it crashed to the floor. She gazed at chunks of porcelain skidding across the polished pine. The snout emerged from a head the size of the green exercise ball she'd used as a desk chair the past six months. Her lower back pain had eased since she'd switched to it. Segmented legs followed, seemingly careful to avoid sharp glass shards jutting from the window frame. 
graceful as a ballerina's, a right leg, long as a vaulting pole, stepped into her, stepped onto her blue and green braided rug, the one she'd crafted as a teenager. A left leg followed, then another right, left, right, and left. Her jaw dropped as she witnessed the delicate placement of the, what were they anyway, feet, leg extensions? She'd often wondered about this when observing mosquitoes around the lily pond in her backyard of her childhood. And when she swatted at one, that had invaded the privacy of her bedroom at night. Could a creature of this size know about stepping with a measure of care on footlong feet? Covered in brownish scales reminiscent of chain mail, the narrow body stretched nearly the length of her front hall with parchment-like wings folded against it. And she noticed an odor, a kind of stench that reminded her of the blood meal her grandpa used to spread around his tomato plants to keep out the deer. But it was his eyes that held her fast, somehow forbidding her to move, holding her captive, but not against her will. Fascination overcame fear and a calm relaxed every tensed muscle. Then she remembered what a man who'd miraculously escaped, the only known survivor of an attack had said. He'd had to endure a lengthy transfusion after, afterwards, but recalled being spellbound by the insect's gigantic welcoming eyes. Within a week, however, the poor fellow had died from a blood infection. Before her, the massive head cocked to one side as if studying its prey. She saw her reflection many times over in its bulging compound eyes, like a creepy funhouse mirror, she thought. Delicate as peacock feathers, antenna on either side of the proboscis flitted in constant motion, searching, searching, brushing first over the cedar chest coffee table and its stacks of South Carolina wildlife and biology, biology today. Then the sofa bed where Timothy's brother used to crash when he was too drunk to drive home from boondocks. And finally the cherry corner cupboard, its bevel edge windows showing off her mother's wine glasses. She jumped when the lengthy, lengthy proboscis smashed the viewing panes and treasured crystal in one swoop. I should run, I should run, played over and over in her mind, but still she sh stared in disbelief and awe at the monster before her, disgust and enchantment continuing to render her rigid. She caught a flash of movement outside. A quick dart of her eyes revealed the word SWAT in huge red letters on the side of a government truck. The DDT truck, she thought, I'm saved. But the relief that flooded her mind was quickly displaced by confusion when her abdomen, exposed beneath the hem of a short lacy summer blouse, abruptly grew cool and tingly, then a pain like a hard pinch shot through her midriff. She looked down. The behemoth mosquito had poked its proboscis into her navel. Its outer reptilian protective sheath was folded back on the surface of her skin to reveal a hard, round shaft of needles buried in her belly. With lightning speed, the hollow tubes began to turn red. Horrified, she realized her own blood was gushing into the mosquito. The skin around her gut was morphing to an opalescent white that spiraled out from her navel. Her innards felt as if an industrial vacuum cleaner were sucking them dry of blood, tissue, oxygen ripping out every fiber. In excruciating pain, she sought a return to comfort from the compound eyes, but now each of the dozens of chambers glowed a livid, evil scarlet. This time the scream began in her lungs. Like giant bellows, they pushed it out with every remaining liter of air. The horrific primal sound reverberated in her ears, her brain, her spine as life erupted from her. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. Whoa. That's all I'm reading tonight. <laughs> I don't know. I think you're finding your, your zone here. You think? <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to ever look at a mosquito the same way. Again. Oh, goodness gracious. I'm just glad it's winter time right now. I'm like, yay. Me too. Me too. You have me Be sitting careful right. when you go outside. You have me sitting right on the edge of my seat every morning. That was great. Thank you. It was fun, fun to write. I have to say. Have you asked? Uh, um, have you asked the low, uh, low Country Weekly if they want to run that as an art? As a, no, I, as an story? I think <laughs> I not. Think, I think a real estate agent would be up in arms if you did. <laughs> I think so. All right, so oh everyone, God. get out there and buy your navel protector for the <laughs> time. And uh, and with right. that, thank you, Catherine Tandy Brown. And we're going to move on to what I hope might be a more gentle, or but it could be surprising. Our next is a poet, which is Emily Davis Fletcher, but I can only see Emily's screen. I don't know if she's gone away for a minute or 
Maybe she ran away from that story. <laughs> there we are. Hi. No, I really like that. I remember that story in Spirit Writers, and I was like, I love this. This is <laughs> one of your best. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, Emily Witter, talk to us a little bit about your reading tonight. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I like the surreal. That's why I really liked Catherine's story. Um, so I'm reading something also sort of surreal. Real and then go surreal. So, okay. Um, so this is just a short poem. It's actually just part of a poem, a much longer poem that I'm, that I'm working on, but um, I'm just giving you part of it tonight. And um, let's just say the title is uh, Love is a Whale, okay? Mm -hmm. A whale is in the animal, um, but it, yeah, it could go the other way too. <laughs> okay, um, Love is a Whale. In a sun-splashed room, oh wait, I pulled up the wrong thing, I'm sorry, okay. In a sun-splashed room full of harpoons, we glide along with a crowd, gazing at shanks and barbed mouths that remind me I'd rather study wet bark. Harpoons the length of my arms and legs, my torso, mounted on walls or under glass. A woman cuts in front of me to peer closer at the date on a plaque, 150 years ago. The intentionally soft iron twisted by the, twisted by the will to survive. I lose you. Just when I feel I can't take another harpoon, I step into a champagne light that cups a life-sized sperm whale, floating off the floor, suspended, suspended by invisible cables. I hear a fizz when I get close, sense the heat of your orange sweater you carry. Where have you been? My blood whispers to my fingertips, a message for scars and dimples on the soft cream body that cannot be touched. The faint smile on the horizon of lips as if near extinction never happened. A rope stops us from walking underneath where I most want to stand and look up, where sex and birth and shit happens. We could be crushed. We keep walking around the whale, talk about the early spring, magnolias erupting yellow pollen on our cars, your deflated quiche at lunch. On our third lap, you confess you were a boy scout Guess we won't be sneaking under any ropes, I think. What do Boy Scouts sell? Ammunition, I ask. You laugh. The diamond glint of sea and the whale's side unzips as long as your laugh, as wide as your smile. We dive inside. Oh. <laughs> There's some humor in this poetry this year. <laughs> <laughs> Usually you don't take us that way. And the other thing is, is love, love is a whale and love is a cat. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Beautiful imagery. Yeah. Oh, thank you. As always. Yeah. Great imagery. Deflated quiche. Oh, yep. <laughs> Deflated quiche. I can tell you what restaurant that's from in Savannah if you want to know. <laughs> They're not listening. No, no, we're not doing Yelp reviews on open mic. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> okay, well, let's follow that up with another uh, another interesting writer, Miss Brooke McKinney, um, who just took a swig. Are you are you ready to read here this evening? Yes. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm gonna not read from my usual project. I'm just gonna read a couple poems. All right. <clears throat> Had a fight with my printer earlier and I did not win. So I will have to read this from my screen. Is that a poem? <laughs> <laughs> Would be an angry one if it were. <laughs> that thing downstairs. Uh, <laughs> um, so let me minimize this real quick, hold on. I still want to be able to see you. Okay. Um, but y'all can't see me, can you? Can you see me? Yeah, we can see you. Yeah, you're great. Okay. You're, you're, everything's good. Yeah. That's why I like to read from paper. Okay. Um, okay, so this first one is called um, Delphinium. 
sorry if I'm looking in the screen. I'm not looking at you weird. It's just I can't really see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Time's up. <laughs> oh, okay. good. that was it. That was it. Started with the printer and ended there. That was good. <laughs> uh, no, here we go. I'm sorry. Um, okay, Delphinium. The florist asks, what flowers would you like to wear in your hair for the wedding? I think all of them, but my head is not a garden and cannot hold such beauty. Tulips will fall apart before I can say I do. Wedding means nothing except it's something I must prepare for. I want something blue, I say. Blue is a color I can rarely touch. Sky, ocean, feeling. Delphinium, she says, walking over to a cooler, pulling a long stalk of blue bell-shaped blooms from a bucket. The blooms are white at the stem, then bleed into, into a soft blue. Be careful, she says. They don't last long out of water. Like fish, I thought, which means they do die. They are beautiful. I want them in my hair. Though she says they may not live through a ceremony, my hair will be their grave. On the way home, I hold them in my lap. They wilt. I revive them in a cup of water in the kitchen windowsill. I expect them to die by morning. I look up Delphinium to search for its meaning. It symbolizes an open heart, but if ingested, toxic to humans. A year later, still no wedding. The delphinium is alive, blooming downward into eternity. It's a sad thing, but it's not dead. I call the florist and I say, you were wrong. One year later, and they're still here, but I'm not sure I can say the same about love. Okay. Uh, how much time do I have? I, I'm 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 kind of just letting the night okay. flow. Right. Yep. Okay. We're good. All right. Um, okay. This is an old one. It's called the Tragedy of Light. I did not live long in sleep. A dog's breath died around my ankles. The swallowing warmth staying there longer than it should. The bedroom walls joined, a kind of weakness, the way light survives the riot of curtains, burrowing a wrinkle into my palm. Isn't that how skin works? The ashtray smells of old years and mistakes and the cracked fingers that held them. If only I had one more cigarette, I could light it, saving it from tomorrow, then the next. Mostly, I am useless. I tuck a leaf behind my ear. I point to birds in the yard. I dig the earth for one worm. I trip over a rock that is you and say, excuse me for remembering. But it's always the way light ruins me, landing on my skin like a boneless, desperate bug. The way a day can bend itself into a perfect moon, erasing what I know. Ooh. Okay. And one more little poem that I wrote a couple months ago. It's called Falling. It is November, leaves are falling. I used to run after them, try to catch one in my palm. And if I did, I cried like it meant something. It wasn't long ago, not a childhood game or a dying memory. It was seasonal, all the way into adulthood. Walking alone, with friends, out on a first date. Hey, wait, I gotta catch one. One leaf turned into more, into hundreds. And from far away, I looked like a magician among the trees palms up, neck craned, begging the heavens for more. But I know the truth as I sit here. It is November. A yellow leaf drifts side to side. I watch from my window. Down, down it goes, I say. I know I should jump up, run downstairs, bust through the door, hands cupped for an offering, my smile wide as wilderness, and a heart so hungry it bends my knees lowering me to the earth for one last chance. But I don't. I sit here, watching. The glass pane, the only thing keeping me from falling. I tell myself, I'll pick it up later, put it with the others. But we all know it's not the same. Oh.
Okay, well, it was worth the wait on the computer screen there, Miss <sighs> Brooks. So thank you very much. As always. Beautiful work. Beautiful work. As always. Wow. All right, Barb, I'm going to put you on the spot to follow up after Brooke, if that's okay. Take a deep breath. <laughs> okay. By the way, I tried catching a leaf yesterday and I fell. <laughs> okay, Barb, we're going to let you read now because we've had enough of these editorial comments. Would you like to take it over, please? <laughs> I will take it. Okay. Uh, this is a poem. And um, I am writing a story about it as well. The remarkable Catherine Tandy Brown alerted me to a beehive. And I was so fascinated by it. I'm trying to write an article for uh, publication. And in the meantime, I've written this poem. It's called Commit to the Colony. Nature all around me, birds chirping, frogs bellowing, squirrels scampering. Crouch low, insects, grubs, animal tracks, crank high, leaves, acorns, higher still, bees. Bees building on a 60-foot barren tree, not in it. Architectural beauty. Hive open to elements, wind, cold, rain. No protection from tree itself. Shaped like a saddlebag, white comb, golden bags, dark bead trim. Why bees have you chosen this way to build your home and your business? Engineers of world renown sculpting six-sided white cells of wax, three sizes equally distant, distanced apart. Living quarters of queens, drones, and worker bees, each knowing its purpose and fulfilling it. Can you survive winter? Can you leave for better pastures? Or do you commit to the colony until death? or spring comes. Mm. Yay. Hey. <laughs> Very nice, Barb. Very wow. Good. Great imagery. And it was uh, a little bit more kind than the mosquitoes. So we're going from mosquito. That was, yeah, nice. Thank you very, thanks for taking us out there. They weren't going into any naval hive or anything like that. Thank you, Barb. Right. Nice work. Nice work. Good luck with it. Thanks. You're welcome. Hey, Barb. We got a lot of poetry going on tonight. So uh, I don't know, Barry, what do you got going on? What are you going to share with us? I'm going to give you a break from my poetry. Oh. No. <laughs> so um, I haven't read from this from, for quite a while. But last week, as I was watching the events of the Capitol unfold, I kept getting this feeling like, is this for real? I mean, where, where is this? Where am I? And I kept thinking about this piece and then I had a dream about it. So uh, unconsciously or something metaphorically, it's analogous somehow. Uh, it's from my collection of micro memoirs. It's uh, a manuscript floating around out there, still getting some very interesting, strange uh, responses. It's called, uh, the, the collection is called Barry Who, 33 Unforgettable Micro Memoirs from Someone You Never Heard Of. And they're all li just little events from my life, a page and a half, two pages, tops, three, maybe three tops, all true, unrelated to each other. And they all come with a date. And I thought I would read you this one. Autumn 2004. This is called Earning Your Red Stripes. Did you ever wake up not knowing where you are for a second or two? Try six minutes. It was a new business pitch, the bane of every advertising creative. We were trying to land Red Stripe, the Jamaican beer worth millions to our Madison Avenue ad agency. Pitches involve volumes of speculative work, marketing strategies, media plans, TV, radio, print, focus groups, slick man on the street videos, online campaigns, direct mail. The goal was to convince the potential client that we were astounding geniuses. It all counted down to the big presentation on a very, and I mean very tight deadline. We had worked beyond midnight nearly every day for a month. 
Occasionally, I would sleep on my office couch, but mostly catch the last train out of Grand Central to my suburban home, grab a few hours, arise around six, catch the train back to the city, start over. We worked weekends, of course, three in a row. I had no day off or night's sleep in four weeks. Let me tell you, this was one exhausted, astounding genius. <laughs> one day in my fake leather Metro North train seat, I fell asleep. I don't know how long I was out. I do know when I woke up, I had absolutely no freaking idea where I was going. Not a clue. Was it dusk and I was headed home or dawn and I was headed to the office? I waited for my brain to click in. Five seconds passed, nothing. 10 seconds, 15, 30, nothing. I could feel the panic setting in. My heart started beating a little faster, then a lot faster. Sweat began to collect on my forehead. I tried shaking my head out of its stupor, but that just spread the sweat around. I took a deep breath and asked the lady across the aisle in a somewhat shaky voice, pardon me, ma'am, what time do you have? 7.10, she politely replied. Even in a moment of panic, you have a certain pride. I was not about to ask, is that 7.10 a.m. or p.m.? I tried talking to myself, stay calm, think. Then what I thought was a brilliant idea. If the men in the car had their ties neatly tied, it was morning. If untied, it was night, right? Wrong, it told me nothing. Some guys are slobs any time of day. I tried burying my face in my hands, forming the equivalent of a paper bag. I inhaled and exhaled repeatedly, hoping it would snap me out of it. But soon I was panicked and dizzy. I desperately wanted to get up and just get out of there. Not such a brilliant idea on a train going 50 miles per hour. I knew I better figure this out fast because I was about to completely lose it, freak out. Then with my last modicum of rationality, it hit me, calm your mind enough to look out the window and note the sequence of the passing buildings. There you go. I had taken this trip twice daily for 17 years. I knew which office buildings came before which apartment buildings, depending whether you were going home or into work. I looked out the window. Oh my God, I thought, slapping the back of my head against the headrest. It's morning, oh. I'm going into work. This day is just beginning. <laughs> I would say it took me a long time to recover from this whole experience, but that would not be honest because I'm pretty sure I never have. <laughs> and how does this relate to the times that we're in? I guess just not knowing where the heck I am. <laughs> you know, like, where am I? Is this really happening? It's really happening. Thank you, Barry. <laughs> Love your tales of the city. Thank you. Okay, I was waiting for a red stripe commercial, though. We didn't get that. <laughs> did you get the account? Maybe we did. Did Maybe not get the account. Did not get the account. Oh. Nope. Well, thanks a lot, Barry. That thank you for the humor this evening. In the My Disney, pleasure. yeah. Jane Adams, would you like to uh, entertain us this evening with some writing? Well, actually, I'm glad you put me up for once. I'm glad you put me on after Barry, because now it'll be a city tale upon a city tale. Okay. And little known fact: Barry and I worked across Madison Avenue from one another but we never ever knew one another at all. But we, our offices were directly across the street from one another. Wow. Did, did yeah. I know that? Yeah, I told you that. It might've been another decade, who knows? <laughs> but... You were still on the train, Jane, just go ahead and read. 
Yeah. He's still recuperating from that client. I know. Are you the lady I asked what time it is? <laughs> Could be. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I was coming from Jersey. <laughs> okay, tonight I have a story from my Boston uh, uh, novel in short stories. Um, and it's called Green Eyes. <clears throat> if you remember the character of Jimmy, he's the token collector that we begin, uh, where I, I begin my book with. Um, and the title of the book is um, Never mind, I'll, I'll think of it later. Uh, so here we go. It takes place in Charlestown, um, August 1970. Jimmy Rourke headed to the bottom of Soli Street, working on a plan to gain readmission to his own place. Bad enough to be docked a whole sick day. He didn't care to spend another night on his lumpy childhood mattress, where his mum let him stay when his wife was on the warpath. He knew Da thought he was a wimp because he never laid down the law to her. But his Da didn't have to live with Angela. He sang a line from an Irish ditty that had been stuck in his head since one of his last pub crawls. He'd no idea which pub, which tea stop, or even which night. But somewhere between the South End and Charlestown, between quitting time and crawling home to Angela, the tune had embedded itself in his brain and he couldn't shake it loose. The exact words had been lost along with some brain cells that evening, but he cheerfully replaced the lyrics with la la's and dee dee's and rendered the tune without missing a beat. He ducked, in, he ducked into the neighborhood convenience store known as Ma and Pa's. Once the door closed behind him, he moved straight to the beer cooler. There on the yellowed linoleum sat three plastic buffet buckets stuffed with bunches of flowers in green and white paper wrappers. He grabbed the largest one and prayed Pa Shaughnessy would be behind the counter today. In the doghouse with Angela again, Jimmy, he winced. Ma Shaughnessy's voice reminded him of glass being ground into gravel. <clears throat> Jimmy followed the curl of cigarette smoke from behind the cash register and came face to face with his tormentor. A plump woman in a house dress perched on a kitchen stool beneath the Marlboro display. She held her arms in a defensive position across her ample chest. Her chin jutted forward. The face reminded him of a burnt down candle, a drooping reflection of a hard spent life but her eyes were as fierce and cold as their emerald color and defied pity. Pa Shaughnessy bragged that Ma was the most beautiful girl he'd ever seen when they met. Old Pa was a notorious exaggerator and teller of tales. But if Jimmy stared hard enough at her when she wasn't looking, he could almost imagine that, except for the voice. You guys always think flowers will make us forget everything. She flicked a long ash into an overfilled ashtray and gave Jimmy a look. He knew that look by heart. Like his own mums, it said she was tired of disappointed dreams. But like every guy he knew, Jimmy could deflect reproach as if it were an attempted tackle. He executed the sidestep play and kept right on moving. Here's the money, Mrs. S. Oh, and here's for a pack of double mint. He flashed a smile at her as she handed the pack of gum across the counter. Ma rolled her eyes. Before he could turn to leave, he heard the doorbell tinkle and felt a whoosh of air as someone stepped in behind him. He glanced at Ma as she registered first puzzlement, followed by recognition and finally surprise. Her disapproving look vanished, replaced by something he'd never seen before. Although her eyes filled with tears, her mouth widened and her entire face fill, lifted in an expression of pure joy. Ma Shaughnessy was actually smiling and speechless for once. Jimmy turned to see who had caused the reaction and was momentarily confused. The only person there was a tall scrawny kid, no more than a high schooler, he guessed. The kid's reddish hair tumbled in every direction from beneath a red skin's ball cap. He was badly in need of a haircut and dressed in t-shirt and jeans. 
Nothing much to look at, Jimmy thought. Then he noticed the emerald green eyes dancing above the freckles on the hairless young face. The kid spoke softly. Hi, Grandma. No, you haven't seen me in a while, but I found you. It wasn't that hard. I knew to take the red line to the orange and the phone book said you were still here. Morris. Her whisper contained the kind of wonder Jimmy would never have imagined coming from old Ma. Morris, come closer and let me see you. Jimmy called out, see ya. His goodbye was ignored. The woman never took her eyes off the kid. She didn't even deliver her usual parting shot about his poor wife when he left the store. She just kept staring at the kid. Jimmy paused outside to take another look through the grimy window, leaning in and shading his eyes against the daylight glare. Ma Shaughnessy had left her stool and come around the counter, wrapping the kid's frame in a bosomy embrace. He watched as the kid's arms went up, unsure at first, and encircled the old woman's body, returning her desperate hug. Their faces were hidden from him, but he could tell from the rhythmic movements of their shoulders that both were crying. No flowers, no nothing. And she can actually love someone that hard? He dropped his hand from the storefront glass, feeling hot and embarrassed for having watched them. He trudged back up Soli Street, no Irish tune on his lips. Jimmy circled the block several times before slowing at his apartment house. He let his eyes wander to the third floor front window and was sure he saw the curtain sway back into place as he looked up. Dropping onto the front granite stoop, he sat staring at the daisies and mums, peeking from the bundle in his arms and tried to collect his thoughts. Only one surfaced. I wonder if anyone will ever hug me like that. And that's it. Very nice. That's a first. Thanks, Jane. That was that's nice. Great voice. Thank you, you really know the, the human condition and you're able to able to, to write it beautifully. Thank really you. Nice. Yeah, thanks. Wow. Ms. Shaughnessy just became an angel in your hands. That was amazing. Yeah, I want to meet Ma. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ma's quite a girl. <laughs> I love that image of the burnt down candle. Oh, the drip, yeah. like a down candle. All of those images were great, but that that really you Thank can you. just picture it. Thank you. And and the emerald green eyes dancing above the hairless face. Yeah. yeah. The Marlboro sign too. Oh yeah. <laughs> Georgia Bank. We've all been in stores like that you know, somewhere. Yeah. Great, great details. You always write with great vivid details yeah. yeah learn that from a good friend of all of ours yeah <laughs> yeah okay june do you have anything for us tonight oh you're on mute yep yep all i set. do i have three really tiny pieces tiny okay. tiny tiny all right we're looking forward to it okay the first one is a little, a little poem that I put in a, italics at the top of the prologue of my ongoing book, Macaroni Nights. And it's called The, Dis the Disruptive Seed. The mm -hmm. Disruptive Seed, I produced chaos in her womb, eliciting her distaste before I sprung out. Upon discharge, she often said, I was not of her body, but of our of my own mind, a child of the animals with long spirally fingers clawing at her hospital gown. I sucked at her breast instinctively. Our eyes met and she froze hard. Mm. So, and that it's supposed to be written by Linda Manzini who is the protagonist in the story. Some of you have heard parts of it. The second one, is a little happier. It's Rain Maidens. She speaks to me, that voice in my head, in confetti colors, stay quiet, 
be still, find your own voice. Light sits in hushed conversation on crumbling stoops. My hands reach out to scoop the colors. They melt into dreams of the moment, drying into syllables of the past. A few bypass their destiny, multiply, burst into caloric energy. Be still, I say. They wink at me, slip between the slats of the porch swing, in wait, accepting endings. And then the last one is, was written recently. It's kind of about now and it's called Splinted. We're in all, I'm sorry, we're all in the same boat. So they say, paddling towards shore, though some of us have motorized oars. There is a somewhat sense of piety to the disorganized random movements of the splinted oars in my control. I seem to possess a blatant disregard of the command to move on, splashing, filling the boat with water, seaweed, dying sea urchins. I long for a pair of motorized oars. I sit in the boat unaware that it spins in place. The waves stir, yet they are not powerful enough to drown me. Time warped, I sit and sit. Where would I go anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Wow, there's a lot of interesting things going on here tonight. We've got the the whole insect and, and bees. Then we've got this traveling through time with Barry and June's in a boat. <laughs> wow. We've got an RV in, in what, North Dakota? <laughs> I've been in this boat for a while because I... Most of you know I had COVID in July and I'm still, I keep having all these lingering after effects. One day I feel great, the next way, uh, next day I don't. And so that's why I feel like I'm not going anywhere at all because I never feel like I'm getting better even though I'm negative. Well, well, well we're gonna fight like crazy. That's <clears throat> COVID syndrome they've talked about, goodness. Wow. I'm losing teeth, I'm losing hair, it's really, Hmm. ridiculous but anyway I'll survive June I love that image of the uh, we're in the same boat I heard Randy Clark who was attorney general in the 60s late yeah maybe right after Dr. King died addressing students at Morehouse and his his refrain all the time was we're in the same boat brother and you know just that image was what was giving people a lot of hope or he was trying to give hope to people at that point um, and yours is wonderful because of the splintering of the oars and the motorized oars. Yeah, we haven't really. Could be more apt, a, a, an image for this time. Right. Yeah, I love the motorized oars. Oh, right? Yeah. <laughs> no. I have to go back to the poem, the first poem, though. I love this line. I jotted it down. Not of her body, but of my own mind. I loved it. You were, you were. That was such an interesting mother-daughter image. Well, those are the exact words I heard from my mother all my life. So oh. I should give her credit for that poem. She wrote that poem. She's whoever wrote that line is a great line. <laughs> Thank you, June. <laughs> Very okay. good. Um, so I, I was, I was uh, lucky enough right before we, we all came online, I uh, had a quick conversation with with Jonathan. I wasn't going to read this evening, but I'm going to anyway. So um, I'd like to dedicate this reading, though, to a friend of mine. Her name is Ann Jay, and she passed away on December the 26th. We um, studied together at Queens um, in creative nonfiction. I don't think this will, you can see her, but that's, that's Ann. Oh, uh, yeah. The, uh, Too young. Yeah, so this is called New Year Courage, Ready or Not. Uh, maybe some of you saw it in the Low Country Weekly, so, okay. And it starts with a quote from Anne that says, I have been praying, though there's not a lot of time for it with all the prayers I'm receiving. And that was from an email that she sent to me on December 22nd, and then she died on December the 26th. Mm -hmm. 
I had already made my annual word choice for 2021, and then my friend Anne passed away. I pretty much finished writing this column, and then my friend died. Now, what I know deep in my heart, faced with the reality that I am breathing and she is not, is that courage is the right word for my new year. I had chosen focus as my new year mantra before I went on a silent retreat in December. Like many of us, I moved from one task to the next, sometimes completing one, most times not, letting an entire day pass with reminders dangling from my to-do list, little tasks hanging on to avoid disappearance by a strike through. However, on December 12th, at the end of a session of spiritual conversation, a priest challenged me to consider a new direction. What one thing should I take away from all of this, I asked, after one half hour of rambling on and on about purpose, change, and growth in my mature life. Courage, he said. Courage, I repeated, perplexed wondering if we were communicating in the same language. Courage. And there it was. No explanation, no how to or why. Just a simple mandate to focus on courage. What had he heard in my conversation that prompted him to believe that I needed courage? He didn't elaborate. Instead, I've been left to my own devices of contemplation rumination, even prayer to try to understand how this man was advising me. Less than two weeks later on Christmas Eve, when Anne suffered two cardiac arrests as aftershocks of stage four uterine cancer, I received a Christmas card. Anita, a best friend, a person that has been in my life since second grade, sent me a note card titled, Yes, You Can. The card is filled with quotations on, wait for it, courage. It begins with a simple explanation from Erica Jong, courage is the only magic worth having. Before I explore, oh, I'm going to go on, sorry. Cutting to a new part. In considering the new year, I think about mystery, restlessness, and tending to others. Do these concepts go hand in hand with courage? Courage to face the unknown, courage to venture out and meet my restlessness with concrete action, courage to understand the needs of others, be less solitary and get involved. Again, I do not know what the priest heard when he listened to me. I do not know if he understands courage as defined by contemporary writers. In my faith tradition, courage is a gift from the Holy Spirit. A person gifted with courage is willing to stand up for what is right in the sight of God, even if it means accepting rejection, verbal abuse, physical harm, or death. Surely Father Joe isn't expecting me to die for anything. Maybe on some metaphorical level, the virtue is to die to self. It's always about that in some way or another, right? Thinking, writing, seeking, consulting, all acts drilling down to a decision to choose my guiding light through 2021. And then Anne dies. I met Anne 13 years ago at Queens University in Charlotte. Both of us were pursuing our second graduate degree, only this time we were following our passion to write. For the past three years, we've been meeting online with Joe, another MFA alumni, critiquing our work, cheering one another on, and deepening a friendship across miles and states. I did not fully comprehend how very sick Anne was. One day we were communicating by email, the next, silence. A gentle light in this world has quelled. Courage is a summons into the unknown. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. encouraged us, take the first step in faith. You don't have to see the whole staircase, just take the first step. 
In her Christmas gift, Anita didn't know I was ready to accept courage as my new year adventure. I didn't either. Goodbye, my dear Anne. I will listen for you in the wind when I need to be brave. I will take to heart the very last thing you taught me. Be open to receive. If you happen to be reading my heart, send a little courage my way in this new year. I'm ready. We all are. Very good. Very strong. Okay, well, it's my great pleasure this oh. evening to introduce you to one of our uh, regular writers, um, Estelle Ford Williamson, is a novelist and memoirist whose most recent book, Rising Fawn, is set in Rising Fawn, Georgia, which has already won awards from the Sand Hills Writers Conference and the Atlanta Writers Conference. Yeah. Our previous books were Seed of South Sudan, a memoir of a lost boy refugee written with Majuk Mayir and her novel, Abbeville Farewell, historical fiction of early Atlanta. Estelle has received poets and writers grants for readings and workshops in Atlanta and New York and has presented memoir workshops through the Pat Conroy Literary Center and Lou Walker Senior Center near Atlanta. She's been published fiction, she's published fiction in Short Story America, the Louisville Review, and the Pettigrew Review. And tonight she'll read from Rising Fawn, a book that has been praised by Valerie Sayers for its depiction of place, and Cassandra King for its poetic images and fast-paced narrative. It was published January 5th by Wiffenstock of Eugene, Oregon. And I'd like to introduce with huge congratulations, Estelle Ford Williamson. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna try and read this from the screen simply because I can't see how I'm coming across, uh, but I don't like too much of my head down. So um, it, this is chapter three, um, our, char our character Claire, the main character, has just been told by her husband that he need, she needs to leave their house. This is a nice, wonderful home in North Atlanta. They're both professionals. She's a life coach. She tells other people how to run their lives and be successful. And here he's kicking her out of the house. Seems like she engaged in some, or she had some credit card theft that occurred unbeknownst to her. It wasn't the card, it was the identity. She's supposed to owe $10,000 due to cash advances somebody made out in California. You know, she's in Atlanta. But anyway, long story short, her next task is in a house of any sound, took a breath and punched the law firm's number. I was recommended by Kitty Kramer, she told the assistant on the line. It's about a separation. Separation or divorce, the woman inquired. Uh, I don't know. A moment later, Sherry Goldstein was on the line. I'll be glad to meet with you, she said quickly. Her voice was surprisingly husky, like that of an older woman. Bring financial statements. I don't know if I have anything like that. Get them. I'm guessing if Kitty Kramer sent you, you're in deep trouble. You don't have a moment to lose with this. I don't know if I want to go for the jugular. That's all I know how to go for. I'm for you, kiddo. And if you don't want a fair settlement, you need to find another attorney. Claire felt pressure oozing from the woman's voice. Her words were sharp, seeming to give off sparks like knives hitting a rolling tire rim. Maybe I'll do that. Look, honey, Sherry's voice softened and she slowed down. The knife was off the tire rim. I get calls all the time from women who want to divorce their husbands. There was a pause, an intake of breath. I'm a breadwinner myself. I can't make a living with your, you ambivalent about what you want to do with your life. I guess it's hitting me a little hard what I need to do. You have a lot to think about. There was a hint of sympathy in Sherry's voice, a deep exhale. I'm in business to help people. The way I help people is by going into a courtroom. It's nothing personal, but you need to think some more about what you really want to do here. Another exhale. If you want me to represent you, make an appointment. Wait, I see I have an opening at 1230 today. If you want that, let my office know right away. 
Sherry Goldstein hung up and Claire sat, feeling warm all over, looking at the phone. She was floored by the prickly, jabbing voice, the combativeness of the woman. Then she remembered Kitty Kramer's statement about getting a good, strong lawyer. Claire tried to picture who Willie would get. It would be someone who'd go for the jugular. Claire's body shook as she approached the large entry hall in the offices of Sherry Goldstein. She walked slowly, hoping she'd be able to stop her body from feeling it was flying down a ride, a wild ride at Six Flags. She brought some basic information, but nothing like financial statements. To get those, she would have had to go into Willie's office and he had locked the door to that room. She shivered as she recalled Willie's Arctic manner the night before in their kitchen. Now she tried to think of details of Willie's and his family's business. Did they sell their interest in the apartment complex in Norcross? They frequently talked about REITs and other investments, but she found the too complicated to keep up with. She did well just to make sure she kept up with the market in her own investments. Lost some, gained some, she didn't do badly. Now it made sense though, that the dismissive way her father-in-law spoke to her the one time she attempted to find out more about their business. You don't need to worry your little head with this, Dan Clem had said. She had walked in on a conversation between him and Willie, and she asked about the REITs and how they worked. They were at a family party. Dan had smiled and pushed her onto Grace, her mother-in-law. Grace had a grim look at the time. They were in Grace's large European-style kitchen with gleaming stainless appliances and a wrought iron light fixture that was more like a heavy chandelier. Grace never spoke about financial matters. She laughed after a moment, shook her blonde head and said, too confusing for me. Now it was clear why her in-laws didn't want her to bother. Claire was beginning to feel for the first time that she was a mini car after a wreck with a big rig truck. Post impact, she now felt her arms broken, her hips dislocated and the bloody teeth falling onto the ground. Willie had her good because she couldn't say for certain what he had and that would be crucial in any proceedings for separation or divorce. She should have been less trusting, less ignorant about what his resources were. She still wondered if his anger was about the credit card mess or credit mess or whether another woman, that mysterious laughing phone caller was to blame for the truck wreck. Almost empty handed in terms of what she figured a divorce attorney would be looking for, Claire sat waiting in a large conference room. She dreaded Sherry's scissor-like manner. The real Sherry was a contrast to her picture on the website. There, she dressed in a black suit with pearls and emphasized her law degree from the University of Virginia and her experience with a large downtown law firm before going solo. Here, she sported a purple suit that closely followed her curved figure. Her gold hair was not combed very well. It looked almost thoughtlessly arranged. Claire thought of a couple of female trial lawyers she'd met. They seemed, like to, seemed to favor the streaked or frosted hair of her sister's high school days, only now they called it highlights, all looked smashingly turned out with just enough unkemptness as Sherry displayed to keep them from being confused with the corporate types. Sherry was more welcoming than Claire had thought she'd be. So he's kicking you out, huh? She looked sympathetic. That's what he sounds like. Well, we'll find you a suitable place. That's not the issue here. He can throw you out the door, but we'll find a door for you to come back through. We'll get you all you need and more. Where are the financial statements? I don't have any statements. If you decide to go ahead with this, bring checking account statements, tax returns, you name it. Before we get together again, write down everything that's happened. Oh, and who else is involved? I don't know how to get those. And all I have are mysterious phone calls where someone hangs up and a husband who suddenly wants me gone. Claire found herself almost crying. She had nothing tangible to fight with. Get an appointment with me right away when you have some information. It'll be a retainer of $4,000. I bill at $400 an hour. Claire swallowed hard. This was expensive. That's where I'm stopping. Oh. Yeah, that's. <laughs> oh, <No>, come on. <laughs> I think I'm going to stay married tonight, Estelle. <laughs> just want to try a visit to a lawyer's office you know yeah. lawyer's kind of details for some of us yes it's a little bit too much very it's lawyer. too much it's very very yes i can't wait to read that estelle i'm looking forward to reading reading the real thing 
Oh, good. I'm, I can't wait for you to. It got, I'm, when I think about it, it goes to a lot of places. You know, it really, it's Atlanta, it's North Atlanta, and then it gets up to the mountains. It's something totally different. So between, uh, was Between Georgia the story, the short story is that came from this book? Same book. Oh, so I can't wait. Good. That's why I was asking if Ma Shaughnessy actually, did she ever travel to North Georgia? Because she fits perfectly in my store. <laughs> <laughs> store with the four black uh, the four backs you know she would fit perfectly she could be Cheryl's mom she could be oh, Cheryl's yeah. mom yeah <laughs> congratulations Estelle and just Thank as you. a quick reminder um at Nevermore Books on January 20th wonderful want to celebrate with Estelle and um enjoy uh the change of uh the guard uh Go to Nevermore Book in uh, Beaufort, South Carolina. And if those folks that are listening from far away, if you want to travel to a really great place, Beaufort's the place. And Pat oh, Conroy this said- is be online. This is going to be online. Oh, I'm sorry. It's virtual. Yeah. Oh, I'm so yeah, sorry. It's virtual. Brooke, I'm so sorry. Okay. Brooke, would you like to add anything then about the evening? I'm so sorry. That's no. She's, she's just, it's, it's going to be online and yes, our friends from will be, rising Fawn rising Fawn will be tuned in also okay i will be with estelle and we will yes. be in conversation about okay rising. i'm 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 all i'm i'm so done with COVID. i'm ready for everybody to hang out at a bookstore that actually there is going to be a big bookstore event later like three or four days later but you'll get you'll get word of that later Will we be able to buy books that night through Ever Nevermore somehow? Mm -hmm. So and they'll be signed. Oh, good. Right. Okay. Okay. I'm so okay. Well, um, well, thank you all for being here this evening. Um, it was really a pleasure. It was a pleasure to see everyone. Thank you for everyone that's tuned in tonight. Thank you to Jonathan as always for uh, taking good care of us and and ushering us. Uh, Brooke too. Yes. Yeah. yes. And uh, hope to see you in February. Our next open mic is on February the 11th, 6 p.m. And uh, look forward Thank to you doing this, Vivian. You're, oh, so cool. you're so well. You're you're welcome. You're welcome. My pleasure. Okay, well, have a safe safe rest of the month and uh, happy New Year. And let's all hope for the very best. So yes, take care. Yes, ma'am. Great job, Vivian. Thanks, Thanks Vivian. everyone. Yes. Thank you all. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.